Hello, Slashaholics. Be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also, check out the companion channel, the 80 Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well, as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination, and you are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. But remember, the risk of cheating the plan, of disrespecting the design, could incite a fury that could terrorize even the Grim Reaper. And you don't even want to fuck with that Mac Daddy. Final Destination 3, The Novelization by Krista Faust Chapter 16 Officer Clark stood at the edge of the yellow crime scene tape, watching his partner Polanski taking a statement from the kid whose truck got creamed. Polanski was four years younger than Clark, and painfully serious. Big and quiet, with bland Polish features and a look of perpetual puzzlement, Dominic Polanski was the quintessential straight man. He was the sort of guy that never got the joke, that believed everything women told him and became a cop because he wanted to help people. Clark, on the other hand, became a cop for a much more practical reason. He did it to get laid. It worked, too. Women just love that uniform. The idea that you're going to protect them gets them all gooey and doe-eyed. Under the uniform, Jesse Clark was fit and tan, thick through the shoulders and everywhere else it counted. He had a face that women fell for, strong chin and a roguish smirk, and just a little hint of vulnerability in his green eyes. The kind of eyes that made them want to bake him cookies and kiss his boo-boos. Unfortunately, Clark was well aware of this fact and had several batches of cookies baking all over town. Truth be told, any woman would be much better off with Polanski, who wasn't much in the looks department, but was as simple and loyal as a dog and would make a devoted husband if only someone would give him half a chance. Yet somehow, that's just not how it worked out. The last time Clark had tried to hook Polanski up on a double date, his earnest young partner had gone home early because he had to give an insulin shot to his diabetic cat. You'd think chicks would be all over a guy who loved his poor old cat that much, but no dice. In the end, it worked out just fine for Clark, who wound up taking both girls home for his own private double date. Right there was a perfect example of what Clark was talking about. Polanski had finished up with the driver of the pickup and was taking a tearful statement from a woman who had been sitting by the window inside the restaurant when the accident occurred. She was hot, no two ways about it, with curly red hair with the bleached blonde streak in the bangs, and probably red down below as well. Nice thick legs, meaty and solid with the big round ass, and cute little bee cups under a tight black t-shirt. Clark loved women who weren't afraid to eat, and this girl was at the butchie burger, so clearly she was not the salad type. Her plump lower lip was quivering, big eyes brimming with tears as she pointed to the scattering of glass and metal where the accident had taken place. Obviously, she needed a strong, official man to step in and comfort her, to make her feel safe. 
Yet Polanski was just standing there taking down notes. His body language as neutral as it had been when he was ta talking to the teenage kid. She covered her face with her hands, bursting into stifled sobs, and Polanski looked away from her with his pad in his hand, stiff and uncomfortable. Clark shook his head. The guy was hopeless. There was still the teenage girl to talk to, but she really wasn't Clark's type. Little skinny underage waif who looked like a strong wind would blow her right over. Clark never understood the appeal of younger girls. They were callow and self-centered and thought they were hot shit just because they were fresh out of the wrapper. In Clark's experience, girls like that always required more work than they were worth. The input far exceeded the output every single time. Older chicks, on the other hand, they were more hungry and willing to work harder to keep your attention. Still, it never hurt to test the waters. Clark was never one to limit his options, and girls aside, Clark did have a job to do here. This whole accident seemed fishy from the start, but the events that occurred, as unlikely as they might seem, all looked straight up from every angle. Chance, nothing more. So why did Clark keep getting that strange feeling, like that time they found the severed hand in David Nearly's backyard? Something wasn't right. He couldn't put his finger on it, but it would not leave him alone. Polanski was walking towards him, and Clark headed across the lot to meet his partner halfway. "'What's up, Dom?' Clark asked. "'Everyone's saying the same thing,' the younger man said, checking back over his notes. The cable on the tow rig snapped, causing the box truck to row down the hill, through the lot, and into the vehicles waiting in the drive through lane. "'Uh, Mr.' He turned the page." Mr. Mitchell Pearson saw the truck rolling towards his vehicle and was able to take evasive steps to avoid collision. The two kids, Kevin Fisher and Wendy Christensen, were trapped inside their vehicle by a delivery truck that had backed up until it nearly touched the passenger side door. They were forced to break the windshield to escape. Look, Clark said, I know all this. Did you get a statement from that delivery guy? Polanski nodded and flipped pages. The best thing about having Polanski as a partner was that he did almost all the scut work, without even being told. He actually seemed to enjoy that kind of shit. It's my personal opinion that the delivery driver, Mr. Eamon J. Tanal, was in no way malicious or deliberate in blocking the passenger door of Fisher's truck, Polanski said. He seems more shaken up by the accident than either of the two kids. Just an accident, then, Clark said, squinting at the crumpled remains of the Mustang. Is that your assessment of the situation? Yeah, y yes it is, Polanski said, nodding. Just an accident. Dom, Clark said. Just between you and me? Doesn't it seem odd that the truck made it all the way down the hill and into this lot without getting hung up or hitting the curb or anything? Odd, but not impossible, Polanski said. You're not considering some kind of foul play, are you? Clark shook his head. I don't know, he said. It just doesn't feel right. There is no way to control a driverless truck, Polanski said. Even if the tow truck driver or the guy, Train, who rented the truck in the first place, had wanted to use it to run down those kids, there would be absolutely no way to set up and execute the complex series of coincidences that took place here today. Clark nodded, brow still creased. Well... He said, We'd better talk to the girl. <laughs> Wendy sat in the back of an ambulance in the parking lot of the Butchie Burger. A paramedic was seeing to all the little cuts and bruises she had received from diving into the tarmac and from all the pieces of flying glass and car parts. It was early evening now, and the lights of police cars, fire trucks, and ambulances flashed off the shiny black and white checkered facade of the restaurant, and the windshields of the parked cars in the lot. Brighter lights shone too. The harsh white lamps of a television news crew doing a stand-up in front of the restaurant's trademark sign. A cheery, anthropomorphic Boston Terrier with a chef's hat between his pointy ears and a huge birthday cake-sized hamburger on a platter held high in one paw. She shivered at two of the paramedics as they wheeled the bagged remains of Frank Cheek to another ambulance on a gurney. There was another, smaller plastic packet sitting on top of the standard-sized body bag. It could have been someone's forgotten lunch, but Wendy knew it was really Frank's head. 
The woman who was picking glass out of Wendy's forearm looked up from her work when she felt the shiver traveling through Wendy's body. The paramedic was a tall blonde with a bad complexion and a thick, slightly dumpy build. Her expression was sympathetic but serious. I'm sorry, she said. I know this doesn't feel so good, but you really need to try and hold still for me. Oh, said Wendy. Right, sorry. Kevin crossed the parking lot, eyes scanning the crowd until he spotted Wendy. His bloody jacket was off and turned inside out, draped over one arm. The charcoal gray shirt beneath was open at the throat, and mostly clean, except for a spot or two around the collar. He had removed his tie and stuffed it into his pants pocket. The last few inches of the tie stuck out like a striped tongue. He had a taped up gash on one cheek and a thicker bandage on his left wrist. Like her, he was covered with scrapes and bruises. He frowned at her, both concerned and anxious. Uh, we need to... He gestured with his chin and eyes towards the drive marked out. Right, yes, yes we do, Wendy replied, nodding and pulling her arm away from the paramedic. Look, I'm fine. I need to get home now. But miss, the paramedic protested. Really, Wendy insisted. I'm fine, honest, thanks. Two uniformed McKinley police officers stepped up behind Kevin. One was handsome and dark, while the other was blonde and plain. Miss uh, Christensen, the handsome one said. I'm Officer Clark, he gestured to his partner. This is Officer Polanski. Wendy nodded. She considered asking if the blonde cop was related to exiled director Roman Polanski, but figured he'd either be offended or have no idea who she was talking about. We just need to get a quick statement, Polanski said. Wendy sighed and gave the two cops the short version, the version without the pictures or the cold, creepy feeling that she'd had just before the crash. The paramedic took the opportunity to continue to work on Wendy's arm while she spoke. Polanski listened intently and took careful notes. But there was something in Clark's eyes that made Wendy think he could sense something wasn't kosher. That realization made her want to get as far away from him as possible. As good as it would be to have someone official on their side, she was not dumb enough or naive enough to think that a cop would buy into their crazy theories about the crash and the connection to the accident at the Red River Park. Well then, Polanski said, we're all done here, I guess. Can I give you a ride home? Clark offered. That truck is uh, pretty much totaled. Kevin gave Wendy a warning look, and she got his message loud and clear. There was so much to talk about, and Wendy couldn't help feeling a wave of paranoia. She didn't want to be around cops or any adults for that matter. That's all right, she said. We can walk to my house. She turned to Kevin. I'll give you a ride back to your place from there, okay? Isn't your car back at the uh, cemetery? Kevin asked. Nah, Wendy said, shaking her head. My mom gave me and Julie a ride to the funeral. Kevin nodded and turned to the police officers. Thanks anyways, guys, Kevin said. We'll be okay. It's been pretty traumatic and all. We kind of need the walk to, you know, clear our heads. Clark nodded. Okay, he said. If you're sure that you'll be all right. Sure, we're sure, Wendy said. Please keep in mind, Polanski said, there are several new links on the McKinley PD website that will take you to various trauma counseling and support groups, if you feel any need for that sort of thing. Thanks, Kevin said, trying to sound sincere. That's great. We, uh, we, uh, really appreciate it. All right, then, Clark said. Take my card in case you, uh, think of anything else that might be relevant to the, uh, accident. He held the business card out to Wendy. This is my private number, he told her, 24-7. Yeah, yeah, great, Kevin said, frowning, as he intercepted the card and stuffed it into his pocket. Have a safe night, Clark said. He and Polanski turned and headed back to their patrol car. The paramedic touched Wendy's wrist with her gloved hand. Here, she said, just let me. The paramedic put a bandage on Wendy's arm and smoothed it gently down. Okay, she said. You're all ready to go. Thanks, said Wendy. I'll be okay. Kevin helped her to her feet, and they started across the parking lot toward the street. Will we be okay? Wendy asked, looking suddenly into Kevin's eyes. He hesitated, then nodded assertively. Yeah, he said. Yeah, we're going to be all right. We just got to figure this thing out is all. 
Wendy pushed her bangs back off her forehead. I really hope you're right, she said. Could you believe that sleazy cop coming on to you like that? Kevin said. This is my private number? What a scumbag. Whatever, Wendy shrugged. It doesn't matter. Sure it matters, Kevin said. And if he wasn't a cop, I would have... Hey, come on, Wendy said, heading him off before he got all pissed off and worked up into some sort of a boy-fit frenzy. We have more important things to talk about and think about right now. Yeah, he said as they continued on, starting up the hill toward her subdivision. Still, what's really been bothering me about all this is how, how vicious it all seems. How frank, she shuddered and wrapped her arms around herself. How he died. How Ashley and Ashlyn died. So brutal. It's not just like what we were talking about before, like death is some kind of accountant just trying to balance the books. It's... It's like death is pissed off at us for escaping it the first time and is punishing us for it now. Why couldn't Frank have died in his sleep? Why wouldn't those girls have, have, I don't know, overdosed on Xanax or something? Easy, Kevin said. Easy. Let's back up. Let's try to get scientific about this. Besides being, well, vicious, what does Frank's death tell us? Wendy glanced up at him through her bangs. You are so doing Mr. Parkington from Freshman Social Studies right now, she said. Kevin chuckled. <laughs> wow, am I? He looked away. I guess maybe I am. Well, whatever. What I was saying. He looked down at the sidewalk beneath their feet. All right, Frank's death tells us two things, I think. One, the theory about the survivors of the crash dying in order seems to be correct. Frank was behind Ashley and Ashlyn on the coaster, and he died after them. Two, the theory about the photos predicting the way the deaths are going to happen isn't really paying off. Maybe, Wendy said. I'm still not so sure about that. Kevin continued cutting her off. Come on, he said. We were looking at Frank's picture right before he died. Him on the wacky ladder, right? Well, there was no rope involved in his death. No ladder, no plush toys, no SpongeBob SquarePants, nothing. They turned the corner onto Wendy's quiet, well-groomed street. But I had such a strong feeling about the picture of Ashley and Ashlyn, she said. I... I... She suddenly stopped, closed her eyes, head down, and turned away. Kevin put a tentative hand on her arm. She could feel that he wanted to put his arms around her, but didn't. Wendy looked back up at him. They both stood stiffly apart and awkward. What? Kevin asked. What's wrong? Did you just, did you just think of something? Wendy shook her head. No, no, she said. Nothing. It just kind of hit me all of a sudden. Just, you know, all of it. Uh, you know? She sighed and continued walking, pulling away from Kevin's touch. Sorry, I should have just left town right after the crash like I wanted to. It would have been better not to know all this. No, Kevin said with abrupt vehemence. Never. That's a total cop-out. It's never been better trying to stay ignorant, okay? It's never better staying ignorant. Willful ignorance is just a deliberate surrender of control. Wendy looked up at him. Willful ignorance is just a deliberate surrender of control, eh? She smirked and looked away. You hear that one on one of those self-empowering video infomercials or something? Kevin frowned, looking genuinely stung. Quit patronizing me, Wendy, he said. You think I'm stupid just because I'm athletic, but you don't know anything about me. You have no idea what it's like to live with a father who calls you a fag if you use a word with more than two syllables, or a bunch of so-called friends who would put cryogel in your jock if they ever found out that you actually like to read. You learn to keep your head down, to keep shit to yourself, and only open up to people you trust. It's the only way to survive. I didn't know you liked to read, Wendy said softly. You never asked, did you, Kevin said. You always just wrote me off as Jay's dumb jock friend. I'm not the total meathead that you think I am, Wendy. I don't think you're a meathead, Wendy said. Before she realized what she was doing, she reached out and touched the prickly angle of his jaw, just beneath that three-inch gash held closed by a neat little row of transparent tape segments. He looked down at her with those hurt blue eyes, 
and she knew that he was right. She had been treating him like a dumb jock. She had never really given him a chance. Jason had tried to tell her that there was more to Kevin than she imagined, that there was intelligence and depth beneath the dirty jokes and goofy slapstick routines, but she didn't believe him. But thinking about Jason while stroking his best friend's warm, unshaven cheek, looking into those blue eyes and fighting to suppress the undeniable attraction that she felt twisting and growing out of control inside her belly, filled her with hot, anxious conflict. Um, he said, eyes cutting down in the way. We better... She pulled her hand away and clenched her fingers into a fist. Okay, she replied. Then suddenly they were in front of her house. She stood, half turned away from him. Can you just humor me and come in and look at the photos one more time? She asked. We can look at that one I didn't print out. It'll help us remember where everybody was sitting. Sure, Kevin replied, shrugging. It couldn't hurt. Let's have a look. A few minutes later, Wendy and Kevin sat in front of her computer in her room, clicking through the photos Wendy had taken on Red River grad night. It was kind of strange having Kevin there in her room, her inner sanctum, her own private little world. She had been dating Jason for three months before she had felt comfortable enough to invite him into her room. She had pulled up the padded white bench from her vanity to stand beside her sleek modern desk chair. Kevin sat awkwardly on the too short bench, long legs bent and knees up near his armpits, as he watched the screen of Wendy's computer. Wendy dragged the picture she had shot from the last car on the ride to the front of the open files. It wasn't very good. The attendant, who had scolded her about her camera, had put his arm up right as she took the photo. The wide plaid blur of his sleeve blocked the middle of the shot. Okay, she said. Here's the one that shows the whole car. It sucks, but it's all we have to go on right now. She studied it carefully with Kevin frowning over her shoulder. I'm pretty sure we got the seating order right before. She pointed to the other screen. There's Ashley and Ashlyn's little empty blonde heads with Frank behind them holding up his camera. She pointed to the compact video camera held high above the row of heads. That bossy jerk attendant didn't say anything to Frank about his camera. She moved her finger to a single dark head in the next car back. Behind him is Lewis, Wendy continued, and behind him are the gothy twins Ian and Aaron. See Aaron's hair here? She pointed to a tangle of blue and black dreadlocks sticking up behind the attendant's hairy wrist. And then us, right? Kevin leaned in closer, squinting at the screen. Wait a minute. I think there's a couple of kids there in front of us, but the guy's arm is blocking them. I can't make out who they are. All I can see is a little slice of sweatshirt and an arm. Wendy looked closer, squinting. Weren't they thrown off? Wendy asked. Remember, they were just kids. They... They were too short and the attendant made them get off. I'm not sure about that, said Kevin, leaning back and shifting his weight on the girly little bench. I'm pretty sure those kids got tossed off before, well, before you know, before your vision. Two more kids got on at the last minute. So maybe they stayed on and died in the crash, Wendy suggested. Who knows? Kevin shook his head. No, he said. Maybe you don't remember, but when me and Lewis started going at it, the guy who was running the ride opened cars 7 through 12. The train had two sections, 1 through 6 and 7 through 12. All the seats in the back section were full, and he made everyone get off. Wendy frowned, concentrating hard. Okay, she said. Okay, Kevin continued, holding up six fingers. So, one more time. Ashley and Ashlyn were in seat 7. He put down one finger. Frank was in seat eight, because he took our original seat in order to try and film the girls. Right, said Wendy. Kevin put down another finger. Lewis was in seat nine, he said, closing another finger. Ian and Aaron were in ten. Another finger went down. And we were in the last seat. That's seat twelve, right? He closed his right hand into a fist, leaving only the single finger on his left hand remaining. So those two kids, whoever they are, we're in seat 11, he said, which means they were kicked off the train with the rest of us. The second section went out empty. So who are they? asked Wendy. Kevin shrugged. That's what I'm asking, he said. Maybe we could ask Lewis if he remembers. Wendy snorted derisively. Yeah, right, she said. 
I don't think Lewis could remember what side of his body his ass was on. What is it with your prejudice against us jocks? Kevin asked, suppressing a laugh. Kevin, please, Wendy said. Lewis Romero is so dumb, he thought Destiny was Jason's new girlfriend. Kevin smirked and shrugged. Yeah, you're right, he said. Lewis may be a hell of a fullback, but he won't be inventing a cure for cancer anytime soon. But hey, what about Ian and Aaron? They may be weirdos, but they aren't stupid. They might remember something. Well, whoever those kids were, Wendy said, why haven't they come forward to talk to us? All the survivors seem to gravitate together out of some strange post-traumatic psychics, but only the ones we already know. Why not these two? Hmm, said Kevin, thinking. I don't know. Maybe they weren't McKinley students at all. Maybe they were visiting from out of town or something and then went back after the accident? He gestured to the screen. Whoever they are, I think it's more important to try to figure out who's going to be next, how it's going to happen, and how we can stop it. Right, Wendy said, frowning at the arm blocking the two mystery passengers. She had no idea why that was bugging her so intensely. It was like she couldn't let it go. But I, I don't remember anyone else dying in my vision. She closed her eyes, fighting to remember. I remember Aaron and Ian falling, being crushed against the ground. She squeezed her eyes closed even more tightly, nauseous. And then... Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 16 of Final Destination 3, the novelization by Krista Faust. Again, we get a chapter here that's got some great character development, some awesome extra characters that we didn't really get in the movie, some backstories, um, a really cool scene, you know, where Wendy and Kevin are sitting here trying to put all the pieces together, figure out what this missing piece is. Spoiler alert in 3, 2, 1, 0... If you're still listening, you don't mind being spoiled if you haven't seen the movie. The missing piece being her sister. Um, and it's it's cool to see them, you know, sitting here holding up the seven fingers, putting down a finger, putting down another finger, you know, going through uh, and eliminating, you know, the process of elimination. Um, it felt like the five or six pages of just talking about the cops, though, is kind of like the stuff with uh, the family in the SUV, the guy in the rental truck, it just wasn't necessary, you know what I mean? It was interesting. I wouldn't mind reading uh, some stories about, you know, Polanski and Clark and their adventures as police officers and, you know, they're interesting characters and I would love to hear more about them as partners, as police partners and the kind of crimes they stop and the drama they go through. That would be fun. But this is Final Destination 3, you know, and there's... There's a main story to get to, and as cool as their stories were, and as cool as their characters are, and interesting as they are, it just felt like fluff and filler. And Krista Faust is so good, she can make fluff and filler interesting. So, congrats on that. That's why I love her writing so much. But yeah, that didn't seem necessary for the story. Um, like, that whole six or seven pages could have been not included, and then it could have just said that this cop Clark and cop Polanski come and talk to him. That could have been it. Um, same with the paramedic. It seemed like her lines were thrown in for... She didn't really have to say those things. But I digress because I really enjoy the writing style of Krista Faust because she really makes these characters that don't even matter to the story interesting. And uh, you invest in them. And I'm really invested in the main characters here. And I can't wait to get back to Chapter 17, uh, which I will be on very soon. Uh, I'll have it up on the channel here. I'm really enjoying the book so far regardless of the extra stuff that gets thrown in that doesn't really add to the story, because it's still a fun read, it's still interesting characters, even if they're throwaway characters, and uh, yeah, I cannot wait to see how Krista Faust handles the rest of the story, because we're really getting to the uh, meat and potatoes of it now, folks. Uh, Death has already started crossing names off its list of corrections, and uh, I can't wait to see how she uh, handles the rest of the story. And I'll be back very soon with more of Final Destination 3 by Krista Faust. Until then, thank you so much for browsing in the 80 Slasher Library. This is your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian signing off saying thank you, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's... 
Tony DeVore, Tyrone Kennard, Nick Velcarve, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bree, Bonanza, Jellybean, Ryan Woodward, Allison Saib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, Simonoli, and Carl Eakins. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel on Patreon. I couldn't do this without you. The channel would not exist without you. So a million times, thank you. This is Zach Galligan, Billy from Gremlins 1 and 2. Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination. Greetings, Slashaholics. This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror books, the Bard's Blood Horror Shakespeare books. Hey guys, this is Jason Brooks, Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th Vengeance. Hey, this is Slasher Pepper. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. This is William Pattison, known to Friday the 13th fans as Eric Morris. Hi, this is Deborah Voorhees from Friday the 13th Part 5. Hey folks, this is Adam Marcus, director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa. Hello my friends, this is Tom McLaughlin, writer-director of Jason Lives, Friday the 13th Part 6. Also lead singer of the Sloss. <laughs> Hello, kitties. This is John Kassir, the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. And you are listening. And you are listening. You are listening. And you're listening. And you're listening. I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening. You are listening. And you are listening. And you are lucky enough to be listening. You are listening. Okay, boils and ghouls, you are listening. You are listening to the 80s slasher librarian. 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 The 80s slasher librarian. To the 80s slasher librarian. To... 80s Slasher Librarian To 80s Slasher Librarian To the 80s Slasher Librarian To the 80s Slasher Librarian <laughs> To the 80s Slasher Librarian To the 80s Slasher Librarian Keep listening or I'll kill you You know, I have some questions actually about your name does that mean that you are a librarian for 80s slasher movies? Or does that mean that you were born in the 80s and you're a librarian and you kill people? So you're an 80s slasher librarian. Yeah, see, I'm not 100% sure. And now you don't need the part where necessarily I'm questioning whether you're actually a killer or just a librarian or from the 80s or any or all of the above. Anyway, enjoy and good luck. Crucified in the human frame, a million candles burning for the love that never came. <laughs>